todo. Mike, so yes, doesn't work so well when you talk to it this way. Yeah, it's a thing for you. Yeah, you look at the Yeah. <laughs> Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Tadwick 2022 hybrid conference. This is the symposium number four, which is entitled Sharing and Visualizing Species Data and Information. My name is Paco Pando. I am the moderator of the session. With me, it is William Latte, who is to be the uh, co-moderator and looking after the, the chat in the Zoom. We are grateful for the support provided by Pensoft and Pulisers and Vive uh, Systems teams. This session will be recorded for later viewing. And thank you for joining us uh, this morning, especially after the those who attended the, the banquet last night. A special thanks for the effort. Uh, each presenter will be presented for 10 minutes, and then they will we will have uh, three minutes for, for questions and then two minutes for doing the, the transition to the next speaker. If you are attending virtually online, uh, use the, the Zoom chat for, for questions. And I think that is it for the moment. And with that, I introduce our first speaker, Johan Ilivlan, who is going to talk about linking Finnescandian species of two fungal genera, a test case for linked on end data. Johan? Do I start myself the first slide? No. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, so I am at the Swedish Cent Species Information Center for Art Databanken at the Swedish Agriculture University. Is this supposed to be on already? Or is the oh, thank you. There we go. Um, and I have a couple of co-authors there. Um, so with Finland and Norway. Okay, uh, so this is the Fenoscandian plate with uh, mainly Norway, Sweden, Finland, and part of Russia, that's the red border there. But in this case, it's only Norway, Sweden, and Finland collaborating. Uh, and we have our own taxonomy initiatives, and we have an agreement that we should collaborate. Uh, and then we also have our own taxonomic databases. So in Norway, it's the Artsnavnebasen. In Sweden, we have the Intaxa, and the Finnish have their lai.fi which includes their taxonomic uh, database. And I believe that actually means species in Finnish. So we are trying to connect these databases. Um, so they're actually taxon concept based rather than just name based. So we have identifiers for our taxa. So example could be like this. Uh, and this is actually a, the same concept in these three databases. But rather than connecting them each to the other, we 
go through a link. So the num if we connect more databases, like say Denmark or Estonia or someone, otherwise, if we do linking from each database to the other, it would become a lot of links eventually. But so if you only have to link to this central node, it becomes less of a job. But we just see it doesn't matter much though. So we have a taxon ID there as well. And then we just have to keep track of that. So what's the taxon ID there for the Swedish 4402, et cetera. Uh, but in this case, we, we have established the technology and we wanna test how much work is it to actually establish links, have taxonomist experts sit down and see how much time they, it takes them to agree upon concepts and what names to use. So we used uh, the fungus genus Hygrophorus, or Hygrophorus, I guess, an example of a species here, and uh, the genus Tricholoma. I think they're both relatively common to find in, in the fall. And to have something to start from, we, we went to Checklist Bank with the help of Marcus Döring, and we downloaded lists of names from here. Uh, although this is name-based list, we, we're actually not really using, interpreting the concepts here, just using them as starting points to get names to work with. But, well, unless you have Seen this before you can choose a lot of formats and include synonyms and yeah excel format really neat and you can have your version you download and you can cite that later doi and everything so we got a uh, excel sheet so this is the starting point we just initial lining up of names which, which seem to be the same uh, so there were 35 species of hygrophorus and 60 potential in total in the Fenoscandian area. So while you're working, uh, there is an example here I'm taking. So this hygrophorus agathosmoides, which is very similar to agathosmus, is an example because that's a recent split. I think the uh, agathosmoides was described last year. Uh, so you, if you check that list again, so this is after <clears throat> it turned out that checklist bat didn't have agathosmoides. So it, that name there would actually be the Sensolato taxon. And you can see that in the Swedish name database there we actually have a concept for the the late agathosmus which here is hygrophorus agathosmus slash agathosmoides so if we have observations of that they will stay there unless you can decide which of the two ones in the split you have and it turned out that uh, finland has a collective taxon with four species the pinophilus and the Orleans as well. But yeah, uh, this is what it would look like if you check this in taxonid.org for the like Agathosmus here in the Finnish and Swedish databases. So we need a list of all names and taxa. The experts need a good basic knowledge, but they don't necessarily need to be experts working on the actual genera. Well, that's what they told me at least. And preferably a re relatively recent treatment of the group. So you have something to discuss around. And the results here from the 95 species, they used four to five meetings. Uh, so totaling about 20 hours. And then it had to be entered into the database and, and we downloaded the checklist and stuff. And so we, came up with about 29 euros per species is the cost here for us. That might vary on salaries and stuff, of course. 
Um, so it's actually less time consuming than we expected it to be. And it makes us stay in touch. I mean, these mycologists didn't really talk much to each other before this. So now we have an updated uh, taxonomy and it's harmonized. If, I mean, regardless if we actually do the matching and put them in the databases. So I think this was a, a useful exercise. And so we should continue with this select groups uh, and think about if there are special groups that are needed for maybe red listing or something like that. You can exchange data to assess uh, threats and such. And even if it costs some money to do this, we can actually save time if we can use our own, our respective data and share. Uh, and it could be good to have a plan to keep things updated. I mean, the, once the matchings are done, it doesn't matter if they change names, the concepts are what is being matched, but you need to add in new species and keep track if new splits or lumps are being made. So, but it's not really crucial, I would say. So yeah, these are the people involved and we have links to our databases here. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for questions. I don't see any questions. No questions online then? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It just, we needed to know what is the cost involved if we're going ahead of doing this. So. Well, actually I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, how do you envisage uh, the maintenance of the system in the future? I mean, you have to get together the experts at regular intervals or? Yeah, well, you, you need to find experts uh, and they need, to have time for international stuff, but maybe they can do it as a, just working with the taxonomy uh, on a national basis, but just with the help of uh, colleagues, I would say. Um, but yeah, it takes time and you, you need, that's why I think you need to think about the actual groups that you need this for, maybe it's especially complicated where you need, concepts have changed recently. I mean, I don't think this is a huge problem for birds, maybe. Thank you. There's a question here in the chat saying, do you have plans to, oh, sorry, from uh, Anna Kuibula? Kuibula, yeah. Uh, do you have plans to publish the documentation of the semantic model as fair metadata? Uh, not yet, but I believe we should discuss uh, how we continue once these, because the, the, the last gene was finished matching just uh, a few weeks ago, so it's relatively recent results. Okay, then thank you again. Um, we move on, and our next speaker is Matthew Yonder. I have been told that we have uh, his presentation recorded and ready to to play. So, hello everyone. My name is Matt Yoder. On behalf of my co-authors, I'm excited to be presenting virtually here at Tadwig 2022. And I want to start by saying that while I'm doing the presentation here, this is clearly a talk that comes from many co-authors' efforts in particular the species file group and our many different collaborators. So today I'd like to talk about three things, publishing in general, publishing biodiversity informatics products. I'd like to highlight and introduce a couple of new products that are coming out of the species file group. And in doing so, I'll look at the relationships of those two sort of concepts and 
also highlight some of the challenges that come up when we publish things onto the web. I'm going to use the definition of publish that is as follows. Uh, publish is to transform a product and move it to a new location such, a, such that it is accessible in a new way. So there's a couple of concepts, transforming, moving it. It's somewhere new. It's accessible in a different way. Maybe it was in a database. Now it's in print, um, et cetera. And we'll see those themes come out. So for example, here is a orthopteran, a grasshopper, as it's represented in the data structure of Taxon Works, a big graph of data. And obviously this isn't too useful to people in its present structure. It looks kind of cool. But we transform that data and we present it on the web, perhaps as a taxon page and something that looks a little bit more familiar to people. So this is one quick example. Now to do this, we typically have to go from our research or our collection, collections, uh, digitization projects, for example, through a whole bunch of technical barriers that stand in between our publishing. So those technical barriers may include things like having to have a workbench, a database, or some other uh, content management system, or an Excel sheet. Um, from that database, you need to then transform that data out. How are you going to do that? Your logistics. Once you have the data out, you need some scripts or some other ways to wrap that data to make a new product. And the product could be an HTML page. It could be an actual layout for a book or a hard copy. You then have to deliver that over the web in some technical way or deliver it electronically in some technical way, perhaps putting it on a server that you have to maintain. So there's some technical costs there. And throughout that process, you have to maintain this effort as it, if you want it to persist and it's not just a one-time effort. So typically we break those technical barriers by using things like, for example, the integrated publishing toolkit that comes from GBIF and their efforts. And in that case, we start to not have to manage things like logistics and publishing tools and products and delivery. That's all done by somebody else. We still have some things that we have to overcome technically, running a server, for example, in some cases and maintaining that server. And also perhaps maintaining the software that's doing the digitization in this case. Recently, not so recently, there's been sort of a accumulation of different technologies that have allowed us to publish a little bit more simply. And they sort of fall into three different categories. There's been new increasingly sophisticated workbenches that handle a lot of different data and can manage that for you. And those workbenches are uh, aware of the logistics or have the logistics that can serve out the data into a sort of generalized format, for example, as in JSON. We also have new software products, we'll be exam uh, exemplifying some of those here today, that can take those data and then transform those into new products. And finally, we have new technologies that can remove some technical barriers that deliver the product to the servers that then make that data accessible to everyone in the long term. And so really we can remove a lot of the technical barriers or bridge those technical barriers and let us worry about a couple fewer things. And we'll show some examples of that here. We've been doing a lot with Taxon Works as sort of a workbench, and now we're starting to try to produce what we're calling companion products. These are things that um, are essentially publications coming out of Taxon Works. And these products that we'd like to illustrate today really can be published in four very simple steps here. Essentially, you find some uh, authentication token, you clone a repository to a new location, you edit a configuration file, and you turn your GitHub public pages setting on and you are published. And this is really the self part of the self publishing on the web here. The things that you as a researcher can do when you have all these other tools lined up. So three examples here. The first is something we're calling taxon pages and it is sort of what it's called. Um, well, taxon page anatomy, basically there's a set of uh, panels that all have a very sort of purpose built um, set of goals behind each panel. There's some very basic navigation and you can add your own pages in Markdown to sort of extend out your website. There's also some very basic, simple configuration that allows you to put things like how to cite your site on the bottom. Panel-wise, we're really trying to figure out um, what should we put in a panel and how should we sort of not let features drift and be discussed and debated forever. And so we sort of are working from or testing this concept of having one question per panel. 
As an X, I need Y to answer question Q to audience A. So for the map panel, for example, we might say as a taxonomist, I need a map to answer the question, where generally does this taxon live to the audience of anyone four or older? We don't try to answer any other um, question with the basic map. We also try to sort of simplify things down so that there's one endpoint serving the data to that panel. That means that you can also get the raw data behind any of these simple uh, panels to do your more advanced types of research. And that improves data accessibility. It simplifies the semantics of those sort of complicated graphs that are behind the scene. It allows us to build purpose-built interfaces. Like we said, this is a panel to do that. And ultimately, we hope that Taxon Pages can be used for um, to integrate with not workbenches, not only like Taxon Works, but any um, content management system that serves a JSON result. So we can quickly link up a new panel from a new source of data. It might be uh, Wikidata, it might be GBIF, it might be your own content management system. To do this, we have increasingly complex data, as we meant, noted, these big, huge graphs. There's a lot of effort that has to go into sort of summarizing these data. So in our image panel, for example, we have images that are linked to taxon concepts, specimens that fall into those concepts, observations of those specimens that are linked to images, et cetera. And we really have to crawl through all of the sort of the deep synonymy. And the Taxon Pages project with the example from TaxonWorks does a really nice job of providing simple summaries for very complicated data. Our second product is Distinguish. It's a multi-entry key. It's deployed in exactly the same way we do Taxon Pages. Um, you can take any Taxon Works matrix and turn it into a multi-entry key. And it's essentially a one page app. I don't have a time to talk about a lot of the features, but essentially you can code OTUs or specimens. There's many different trait types that you can code as uh, characters or as your columns. You can use M images everywhere. There's multilingual options available. You can provide co customized taggable sets that can help the user sort of further refine their look into the data. And you can further refine the uh, contents or the endpoints to focus on a particular rank, for example, genus or species. The third product we have is a, something we're working on. It's called a paper, we're calling it a paper catalog. And this is what you'll be familiar with as a very simple nomenclatural catalog that covers things like uh, the nomenclature, but also things like repositories, types, distributions, and references. And then we produce three different formats there. There's an HTML format, a simple one-page HTML document that can go quite, quite long that you can serve, for example, on your own servers on a GitHub page very easily by putting up online. You can turn it in, into an EPUB with the ASCII doctor software. And you also have a markdown version. It all starts as a markdown rendering of that complex network of data that you can then customize and add and edit if you want to go to something else like a Word document or a different kind of publication. So in, in sort of a summary of all of those features, all of these things are literally deployable in minutes now. We've worked with students, we've done it in workshops where we've shown examples of deploying these websites. Most of them, uh, one of them can be done offline. We recognize that we want to make all of them offline. You can run these on your desktop. They don't have to be on a server. So you just click and open the, the um, app on your, or your single HTML page and it will serve it on your desktop which is very nice for exploring and sharing data and sharing views onto your data with your colleagues and colleagues and, and coworkers. Um, we, they all now at present require taxon works, but we are developing taxon pages to be workbench agnostic. And they all serve on tax GitHub pages if you want to use that uh, format. So to conclude um, in doing this kind of work, there's been a couple of key challenges that have come up as I noted as the semantics and our workbenches get more refined and, and better at sort of describing our data, summarizing those for human consumable products like a, a simplified taxon page become increasingly difficult. There's a lot of forking of what to show if this is here and this isn't there, for example. And that's a real challenge. In building the paper catalog, we noticed that people really want a, a spreadsheet of the distribution data that comes out of that, that's summarized from all of the different data sources. So that could come from collections, that could come from checklists, that could come from published data, et cetera. And we struggled to find an integrated sort of consumer consumable standard that can represent all of that data in one place so that the user could kind of just take that catalog data and throw it into a single spreadsheet. So I think there needs to be some work on the standard side of things there. And um, finally, we'd love 
and we plan to work hard at making all these products available completely offline so that you do not need those requests back to the API. And that's another big challenge. And then with that one-to-one -one uh, one -one representation offline, there's issues of latency. How often do you update your offline version? And then archiving. These are sort of familiar concepts to our group. But overall, we feel like it's a, these couple of new products sort of address a nice little niche in this challenge of self-publishing on the web. Thanks for your attention. There's lots of links there. Of course, this is all open source projects that are all available at right now on GitHub. And there's lots of opportunities for us, for you to join us and ask questions. We have weekly events. Uh, we have an increasingly large YouTube gallery of videos, a chat. You can follow announcements about TaxonWorks on Twitter, et cetera. Thanks again. And hopefully I have some time for questions. Thank you very much. I understand that Matthew is available by Zoom for questions. Hi, Matt. Thanks for the talk. Um, here's David Fichtmiller from the Botanic Garden Botanical Museum Berlin. Um, I have a question. Um, have you considered adding bioschema.org metadata to those pages? Oh, we, sorry, cannot hear you. I'm not sure whether this is an issue from our, from this side here or from your side. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. Oh. Uh, absolutely, bioschemas is, is definitely on our radar. We realize that there's some simple semantics that we can add to that um, page. Uh, the, the source is uh, all available right now, and so there's a great opportunity to work with the bioschemas group directly um, to, to do that. So definitely on our radar as something to do in the long term. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe not even long term, short term. Uh, hi, there's a question on the on the chat from Esteban Marentes Herrera saying, "How easy you think one can implement one of these options with an already existing catalog?" Um, I think I think there are some modular concepts for taxon pages, for example, like the panels should be um, reusable with a little bit of work. But I think the devil's probably in the details there. We'd have to see what catalog we're talking about, um, et cetera, to, to, to really understand the, the challenge of the integration. Thank you. Carlos, can you unmute and make your question? Uh, I was going to ask to Matt um, if you have implemented the species profile model. So, um, and this one is a, a model that we are still using in Scratchpads and that matches to what is now called the um, type uh, vocabulary, type description, the beef vocabulary. So, and that's a way for, for example, what you say about geography and so, I am re writing plain text geography there, like country one, two, three, and so on. So maybe this is an option. So a couple things, I'll post a link in the chat to our data model. Um, we do have concepts separated from nomenclature and the panels that are there do use this very deep summary of um, synonymous taxon concepts you know they, they're emerging that kind of data so while I, we haven't specifically uh, matched that to a particular standard but i suspect that the semantics that we have uh, 
um, are adequate for that. I'll post a link to our data model. We've done a lot of work on describing that this year. It came up early this year. I'll post that in the chat. Um, one of the panels does have a free text by content data type as well. You sort of mentioned that. So that's very customizable. There's a nice little content editor there um, that, that one of the panels can represent. So sort of a mixed answer. We, we haven't targeted a specific um, standard, for example, bioschemas or the other standards, but I do suspect that because we have the, the, the rich semantics of OTUs and nomenclature separated, uh, you know, collection objects, et cetera, are all split out. There's a special type class um, that, that we probably have what, what could be used to map to those concepts. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we need to move on on the on the program. And our next speaker, who is in the room, Dimitri Dimitriev, he's going to talk to us about uh, Taxon Works as a tool for managing large biodiversity projects. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dimitri Dimitriev. Uh, I'm working with the uh, same group, species file group, at the University of Illinois. Um, so how does it switch to display? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, I will walk, uh, I will talk about some use cases of uh, taxon works in a couple of projects uh, we are running yeah. at the University of Illinois and uh, much other Talk already what uh, Taxon Works is about. I won't repeat much about this. Again, our group, uh, and I'm thankful to everybody uh, for our collaboration. A uh, few projects uh, which we are running besides uh, Taxon Works, uh, Matt also mentioned Taxon Pages, but uh, we also support uh, two other products uh, in our group's uh, global name architecture. Uh, by Dmitry Majerin, uh, which used to annotate by virtual library with uh, taxonomical name concepts. And Catalog of Life, uh, we have Yuri Roskov uh, and uh, Jeff Over working in our group who helped with the assembly of the Catalog of Life. Uh, this is a representation of our data in Taxon Works, uh, all the tables uh, and the amount of data. I won't go into detail, just one upon few numbers we already have running seven, uh, 37 projects uh more than uh, uh 700 uh, thousand taxon names in the database more than a million specimen records and uh, more than uh, 100 uh, thousand uh, bibliographical references uh, we try to classify it, uh, people who participated in Tax and Works Together may see the slide already, but we try to classify the projects uh, on the kinds of data uh, they're using. And uh, so we divided all the projects in, the, uh, in Tax and Works in the five categories, uh, if they're mostly related to nomenclatural uh, development, uh, digitization, descriptive uh, 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 literature, and uh, geospatial. So if you can see, there are several red, predominantly red projects. Uh, those are collection management project, including uh, our Illinois Natural History Insect Collection. And uh, we have nomenclatural project, which uh, collect nomenclatural data to send the data to Catalog of Life. And uh, we have long lasting projects which uh, trying to do a little bit of everything and uh, one of the project i will talk about uh, my personal project uh, world to Kinarinka database uh, it started almost 20 years ago but uh, five, uh, five years ago chris dietrich and i get funded uh, uh, this uh, nsf grant to do revisionary systematic one of the subfamilies of the group uh, so in, in frames of the uh, project, we converted our data from original Microsoft Access database and uh, bullet to uh, Taxon Works. And um, this is a large group in general. It's uh, okay, I think it belongs to the order of Hemiptera. 
and uh, currently includes uh, 80 families, uh, almost uh, 7,000 valid genera and uh, 47,000 valid species. That's division by the families. Uh, those few interfaces from tax and works uh, nomenclature, uh, Matt already was talking about this, but it's how it's look like uh, from the tax and works uh, perspective. Uh, we have sections with a uh, higher classification, we have a list of uh, uh, synonymy or historical changes, uh, uh, genus species combinations, uh, bibliography, uh, and one thing I would like to point uh, the soft validation section, which we are quite proud of. It's basically try to uh, check all possible rules of zoological as well as botanical and bacterial nomenclature and give you some warning or suggestion how your data could be improved in the database. Uh, uh, matrices and tax and works, uh, we have pretty nice interfaces uh, to work in these uh, morphological matrices. Uh, we can use uh, taxonomical units or we can put a uh, specimen and uh, score those in the matrices. Uh, those are standard matrices and uh, those matrices could be converted to Nexus and XML uh, TNT format we downloaded to use for phylogenetic analysis or if uh, matrices uh, directly used as a uh, interactive identification keys. This was originally designed in 3i but was recently uh, migrated into Taxon Works. Uh, image matrix interface. Uh, um, so we have a concept. Uh, we, we have we are working with uh, many species, many of those which was described just once, and uh, never included into any uh, revisionary project. So we try to collect all the information about those species and put those in the database. So we with standard views of the species in the matrix, uh, those special image matrices, but this matrix could be used directly as an identification tool. Um, we have a variety of filter interfaces, uh, filter specimen, filter images, uh, filter collecting events. Uh, new source interface, we support BPX format for the uh, bibliographical data. And uh, we have nice, nice integration tools uh, if you have DOI for your new source, you can just drop DOI and uh, we try to resolve it through the cross reference and that will pass through individual fields in the database. As well as you can uh, upload PDF files and preview it directly in Taxon Works. Uh, we have uh, uh, integrated level of annotations. Uh, basically any object in the database could be annotated with many different things, identifiers, citations, uh, tags, uh, depictions, Etc. Uh, we have access to the quick form. So we, if you are working with nomenclature, we're trying to predict what you can do next. So you can jump to the OTU and add distribution data or biological association data uh, to the object. Um, and Matt already pointed that we started producing uh, taxon pages. So this is a preliminary interface taxon page generated from Okinorenko project. Um, Data access, we have um, quite a number of batch uploads to Taxon Works, and also we uh, have a philosophy that data should be easily accessed and downloaded from Taxon Works. So we have project dump, individual table, table downloads, API access to the most of the uh, tables. Uh, nomenclature goes uh, to call DP format and catalog of life. Uh, bibliography could be downloaded as bib text uh, or could be formatted to a special uh, journal requirements. Uh, specimen go to Darwin Core Archive and uh, to GB and IDIC Bio. And matrices I already mentioned could be downloaded for phylogenetic analysis. Um, Insect collection database is another big project which we run in the uh, survey and in the university. We started with multiple different databases, FileMaker database, access database, um, online MySQL database for different kinds of data. And we moved all the data a few years ago to Taxon Works. So we have some workflows designed specifically for the uh, data management. This is a specimen digitization where you can create a template, photograph it, and Taxon Works break it uh, to individual section and attached depiction to, to the objects. 
Uh, grid digitization, we did a lot of work with slides. So you, when they scan multiple slides, you can produce a grid and tax and words, and that will break image to individual portion and attach those to in, in individual specimens. Um, load, loan management, et cetera. And that's our representation in GBF. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude and thank you everybody for attention. If you have questions, I will be happy to answer now or after the talks. Thank you, Dimitri. We have time for questions. Um, in Disco, we are also working on the loan management uh, module. Yes, we had it originally in FileMaker database, but we also okay, so do this in Yeah, works. I would be interested to talk to you about later. Uh, yes. So we're we're trying to basically what we're trying to do is that we're trying to capture all the loan requests centrally in one place, but all the comments that goes around the activity about the loan also with, with the request. So sometime the requester might have questions about the specific loan. So there's sort of like a help desk module that would come with that. So some of those components might be reusable in other other yeah areas. for for new loans we basically track individual specimens right. uh in the in the loan management for all the loans we scanned all the historical loan documents and just mark the number of material okay. which was loaned so you can don't specify individual specimen but basically say that this group uh, this or this genus or this species was uh sent for the loan and amount of the material and track it when it was sent when it was returned was it returned? Yeah. Could we send a reminder, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, we'll, we'll talk later. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Hi, Dimitri. Uh, this is Deb Paul. I'm wondering how many people you have as collaborators inside your instance of Taxon Works and what roles they play. Who are they? So in the Canarinka project, we have around uh, 20 collaborators. Uh, I, I didn't check the last number. Uh, and uh, we we trying to invite collaborators uh, from all around the world to work in the project. Uh, but uh, we have uh, different people. We have uh, people like Chris and uh, myself uh, working on the data. Uh, we have some hourly uh, students and helpers uh, working on the project. And uh, we try to invite more and more people working on the specific projects. Uh, we have uh, faunistic projects, uh, women working on the uh, Iberian Peninsula fauna started working. Uh, we had a collaborator from Saudi Arabia. He mostly uh, interested in morphological matrices. So it's basically just uh, we're trying to see what's uh, interest of the people and what I uh, want to do in the inside of the project. We still have time for questions. Anyone from the chat? Hi, Elspeth Astor. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering um, about kind of entry level for people to come in and, 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 and work on this, particularly looking at um, students coming through. Um, do you, I think the species, you, you have a sandbox area in there, is that right? Well, we have training databases, sandboxes, yes. We have multiple instances, so instances of those, yes. And is but, that something that we can, or that, how open is that? I mean, is it? Um, uh, well, you still need to ask somebody to add you to the, a database project but it's simple step so we if you have an access you can bring all the students for training etc or you can ask us to add some people to the database that's that's possible but uh, all those training uh, data sets you should realize that those are not permanent databases it's just for training so they can just disappear anytime 
Absolutely. It'd be, it'd be really nice to kind of get more information about that out. And I was speaking to Deb about that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And with this, we move to our next speaker of the, this first part of the symposium. Um, Maya Sarawi, who is going to talk to us about near side structured knowledge extraction framework um, from species descriptions. Maya. Is it working now? Yeah. So, hello everybody. I'm Maya Sahrawi, and I'm going to talk to you today about a framework we've worked on at Sorbonne University and the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. So, this framework is called NEARSIDE. And NEARSIDE stands for Structural Knowledge Extraction Framework from Species Descriptions. The idea behind this work is to develop a deep learning model that can translate textual species descriptions into knowledge graphs that can be linked, measured, and uh, uh, and uh, compared with other species descriptions from other sources. So the uh, I, I be before I begin, I have to say that I come from an informatics background. So if you have any really biodiversity oriented questions, I will be glad if, you, if I can't answer them, I will be glad to ask my colleagues to answer them on the Slack afterwards. So the uh, triplet structure is one of the most used structures in on the web and by the deep learning community. In this structure, a piece of information is represented by a set of three elements, the subject, the predicate, and the object. And this structure is actually used a lot also in order to represent species descriptions as knowledge graphs, as we have seen during this week. So um, this, uh, but this representation actually takes a lot of time and needs human intervention in, the, in order to construct the graphs. So it can benefit from deep learning techniques in order to be automated. Uh, in our case, uh, the triplets we would want to be extracting from our species descriptions would look like this. They have to contain the name of the organ as the subject, the, uh, the, the descriptor as the, uh, the predicate, and the value of that descriptor as the object. For instance, from a sentence that looks like this, we would want to extract all the descriptors related to the uh, principal organ here. For instance, the uh, one of two, the triplets we would want to extract would be Bracht's form of eight here, Bracht being the organ, form, be, form being the descriptor, and of eight being the value of that descriptor. So um, uh, the, uh, spe the, species, the morphological descriptions of species are stored in uh, flora and fauna corpora, but we will mainly be focusing on flora for this uh, presentation. So a typical uh, flora corpus uh, looks like this. We have uh, the uh, information of interest that is uh, our species descriptions, but we also have a lot of metadata like the footers and the, the headers you can see here, also figures and uh, the legends of those figures and other descriptions of fam families and genera. All this metadata has to be removed before we start working on our species descriptions. So this project has a heavy pre-processing step that has been done before the structured extraction, uh, uh, structured knowledge extraction part. So uh, structured knowledge extraction in natural language processing can be done by either by uh, one of two tasks, uh, either by named entity recognition or relation extraction. But we all know that uh, deep learning models require a lot of annotated data annotations that we do not have in our case, since we do not have a direct matching between the, species, the textual species descriptions and the triplets we want to extract from them. So we find ourselves in what we call a distant supervision uh, context. Distant supervision only means that uh, we don't have a direct matching between what we want to, to put as an input on our model and what we want to extract as an output. So uh, this context will privilege the use of named entity recognition instead of relation extraction, simply because this task is uh, more studied in a distant supervision context and that it needs less human intervention. 
So named an entity recognition is a historical task that was uh, that began in the 1990s on the message understanding conferences. It simply consists in detecting a word in uh, a sentence and affecting that word to a given uh, class. For example, it would be detecting the word Google here and affecting it to the class organization and detecting the word American and affecting it to the class uh, nationality. In this task, it is really important to train our model on uh, some words and, uh, and verify if it can generalize on words that it hasn't seen during the training. And uh, in our case, the classes we would be wanting to extract would be types of organs and types of descriptors. We will come back to that later. So um, distant supervision for named entity recognition consists in using a small annotated glossary that would contain a list of words affected to some classes and project those words on our textual data in order to create a, what we call a distantly annotated uh, data set for named entity recognition. So it, is, it costs less than actually asking a human being to annotate, annotate all the text and affect each word of the text to a given class. So what we have to do first is to create a glossary that will contain our words and the uh, their concerning classes. We've worked on creating a glossary that contain, contains 972 words. Each word would be affected to one of the classes here. So we have classes that uh, are related to organs and classes that are related to descriptors. And uh, after creating the, this glossary, we will project we projected it on our species descriptions and created a named entity recognition data set from species descriptions. After creating the data set, we can analyze the uh, occurrences of the terms according to the classes on uh, our text. We can see that we have classes that are less better, less represented than others. For instance, the class color here is represented by more words and those words have more occurrences than the words that are uh, associated to the class disposition. But this only, uh, but, uh, but this is only using the glossary and this is what it, can, it will be helpful to train our model on this data in order to learn more words for the class disposition and for the class color also. So uh, once we have our data set and we've analyzed it, we use a, a deep learning model to train uh, to, to be trained on our data. So the chosen model is the BERT model. It's, it is the state of the art on named entity recognition in natu and the natural language processing in general. I, we actually have developed um, all other variants of this model that fit better to our data, but we do not have the time to live in the technical deta details now, but I would be glad to answer your, your questions, your technical questions, if any, after the presentation. So now, uh, once we have a model that can extract entities from our, uh, from our sentences or from our descriptions and classify them on types uh, in the term of types of organs and type of values, we can uh, simply use the rule that was presented before in order to construct triplets using those uh, classes. For example, our, uh, after named entity recognition, our model will classify the word lamina as being an organ and it would give the type of organ it is. And it would classify all the words that are blue here as being descriptors and give the uh, type of descriptor uh, that it is affected to. We will use those classes using this uh, rule in order to create the triplets that we can see here. For example, the first, uh, the first element of the triplet would be the main organ in the sentence which is lamina. The second element would be, uh, for example, for ovate, it would be the class of uh, the descriptor ovate, which is form. So we'd be having lamina form and the value of this, the descriptor, which is ovate. So we can, uh, using this rule, extract uh, these uh, four triplets from uh, this sentence. So it, it's uh, actually a little bit hard to analyze triplets when they look like this. So what we've done is that we, uh, what we do is that we will represent those triplets in the form of uh, knowledge graph as seen in here. So this knowledge graph was, uh, was extracted using near side uh, applied on, uh, on the description of uh, the sterigma acuminatum in flora neotropica. And this is the, uh, the graph that we've ex extracted. The blue, no the, all the nodes in the graph represent extracted named entities from the descriptions. We are the blue nodes represent the, 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 extra, the named entities that represent uh, descriptors. 
and the other colored node will present the organs. The uh, nodes that the, the organs that share the same color are related to the same same type of organs. So, for uh, for example, the green nodes here represent uh, sub organs of the organ leaf, and the yellow nodes here represent sub organs of the color flower. So. If we zoom in this particular organ here that is green, so uh, since it's green, we know that it, it belongs to the class leaf. We can see all the descriptors that were uh, extracted from the, the descriptions that are associated to the branchlets of the Sterygma acuminatum. Actually, we can see all the descriptors because there's still one left there, but we can see uh, one, uh, some of the descriptors. So you can see that uh, uh, the value of the form can be either smooth or ridged. And the, the value of the color can be brown. And these are all the descriptions that were extracted from, um, from Flora Neotropica for this species regarding the branchlets. So as a conclusion, uh, Nearside is uh, uh, a structured knowledge extraction framework that can be applied to several data sources for species descriptions, thus making it possible to link different species descriptions from different uh, from different sources to make them easily compared and measured. Thank you for your attention and I will be glad to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Time for questions. Hi, it's Damiano Zoni here from the Research Institute of Natural Forest Belgium. I have two small questions, maybe. Uh, first, of global results. Um, how, how, how many data sets did you test this uh, model? And uh, how are, which are the results afterwards? Okay, so if I can come back. Actually, the uh, since the, uh, the deep learning part is the one that can be tested. The triplet extraction part cannot be tested because we do not have tests for it. But for the uh, named entity recognition part, we've tested it on, uh, we uh, naturally we have a data set that contains all uh, flora neotropica and uh, sentences that were split from flora neotropica. Um, flora neotropica is actually after the cleaning, uh, maybe 3,000 sentences, 20% for the test, 80% for the training. In the 20%, we've extracted uh, all, the end, all the sentences that contain only words that weren't seen the, during the training, because obviously that would, there would be a novel lab bias. And the results on uh, all the test set in the detection uh, would be, we had up to 90, 94% for the F1 score, which is the accuracy. And for the classification, we have 80%. 80 so the classification is only for named entities and how they are affected to the, uh, their respective classes, while the detection is the ability to, of the, the model to say if this is a named entity or, or if it's not an interesting one. I don't know if I've answered your question. Are the notes clickable or this is there? Are the notes clickable to the places in the text file? I'm sorry, uh, I didn't are, hear. Are the notes clickable to the places in the text found? Are the notes linkable to the place? Actually, they can be since we have the we have uh, when we put a sentence as an input in our model, we have the index of uh, its place in the sentence, so they can be. In, with our model, it's not an information that we put in the graph, but it can be uh, it can be easily done. And uh, Carlos has a question. Carlos, can you mute and ask a question, please? Yeah. Uh, so this this work is uh, very interesting uh, to me. So I'm currently working with uh, Biofit and Senckenberg, and we do this sort of work. So we we mobilize literature uh, data, including morphological data. And then what we do is that we annotate with ontology. So we have a text technology lab partner from the University of Frankfurt, and they do the annotation work. And then we have a portal, which I invite you to check, maybe something interesting to you, uh, biofit.de, 
And there in the portal, the results are searchable by keyword and um, semantic. And then we use ontologies to link this sort of term. So we have annotation by taxon, by um, anatomical structures, time, uh, places, and so on. And maybe this is something for you. And then my question is actually, if you're already uh, doing this bilingual, like maybe um, having ontologies or, or any sort of structure with synonyms from English to French, because we are interested in Central European literature in the broad sense and in making our ontologies uh, multilingual. So we are trying that with English and German, but if you're working towards English and French, then there's a potential collaboration for us and regarding plant uh, science in general. So, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Actually, for the first part, it would be really interesting for me if you have annotated data, clean annotated data, to test my models on them because it's, uh, well, uh, since I'm in a distantly supervised context, often we have to, uh, to, to be really careful with the, the, the results that we get, the performances that we measure on these uh, annotations, and it would be a really uh, something uh, really useful to be able to test on clean annotated data. For the second part, uh, yes, we've, uh, we, we have a PhD student. Who, actually, I'm a part of Ecol Plus, which is a project that works on uh, using uh, specimen collections you know, and extracting knowledge from them using deep learning techniques. And we just started working on French corpora on um, Les Fleurs de la Nouvelle Calédonie. So uh, I think uh, we can talk later and uh, it's really interesting actually. And we're, we're aiming for the multilingual uh, part. Super, many thanks. Thank you. More questions? Well, I have, I have one. that for a given work, for instance, Florania Tropica, you have to do some preliminary work in the sense of extracting the words and then the how, how much work is to, to do that preliminary work for any new uh, treatment, let's say. Okay, so actually the uh, at the beginning we were doing it kind of manually but uh, we have automated it early uh, recently and it's uh, possible the, the, uh, the cleaning script can be uh, used on other uh, corpora, not directly because we have to check the corpora first and change some regular expressions, but in, uh, in general, it can be used. So I'd say that uh, the time it would take is only the time that it takes to change regular expressions and apply it on the data. So maybe two, three days uh, for applying, and uh, it depends on how uh, the uh, the corpora is different from flora neotropica for changing the regular expressions. I have another question, which is, what do you do with the the results, the 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 RDF files? What do you with? Do you make new standardized descriptions? Do you make uh, identification systems? What do you do with that? Um, well, this project is a part of my PhD project, which is uh, actually using those uh, graphs in order to make uh, uh, the species identification. The idea that I'm working on uh, right now is to take those graphs and to match them with, with images and see which uh, parts of graphs are present in the images and take uh, a decision afterwards on the species. But it's still in prog progress and uh, we hope it will work. Thank you. With this, we have some time now for more original discussion and for further questions to the presenters in this uh, session. So anyone wants to make a, a comment or a question to any of the, of the speakers this morning? I had a second question for her. Um, is the glossary creation completely manual step, or it's uh, did you try to automatize even that? So, 
So the uh, glossary creation is uh, manual. The um, the uh, the words of the glossary can be extracted from automatically extracted extracted from a glossary on the net. We did not do that. We uh, we actually read some glossaries, uh, extracted some manually extracted terms from them, and then affected them to the classes. But it can kind of be done uh, automatically for the word extraction part, but the uh, effect in the work to the classes has to be uh, manual because it's uh, the only expert knowledge we have in order to train the uh, the model. Well, questions or comments? I actually got the same questions like for the ladies actually doing the knowledge graph and the near side. And I think your project is basically a name entity recognition. Is that right for the NLP problem? But you mentioned that you probably want to try to use it for the image uh, recognition part as well. So is it something like landmark recognitions? Because it seems like in your paper, it doesn't actually mention it about the name relations, extraction and recognition. So if you actually really want to apply it with the image processing for uh, object recognition or landmark rec recognition, so how do you actually will do with the relation between, because like it probably will actually have affecting the ways of recognition in the image, I mean. Actually, the, um, the multimodal part where we have the, uh, the graph plus the images, uh, we, just identify the we just identified the task that we want to use for that. We actually, we didn't identify it. We changed an existing task. So it would be a multimodal named entity recognition. Uh, in uh, it is used a lot on social media in order to um, to actually for in this task in social media the image is considered as a, an additionary uh, information and the idea is to extract entities from the text as we've done here but with using the image as an information uh, um, complementary information in our uh, case it would be the the text that is the uh, additional information and we would be wanting to extract only the entities and that are present in the image which is which makes it kind of different from what we did we did here since we don't have the image anchor in order to not extract entities that are not present in the image and the uh, triplet reconstruction part actually will look like this one uh, afterwards i don't know if i answered your question Hi, this is Deb. Before I ask my question, I was wondering if there's any more on that. I don't want to change the topic on the named entity recognition, et cetera. Are there more comments, thoughts? I'd like to see, I'd like to say very cool. Um, we did a mini version of what you did with gathering um, OCR output from herbarium sheets, many, many herbarium sheets. And then we had the sort of atomized data already. So we had the sort of somebody's already plucked out and atomized all the information. So we had a training set, if you will. And then we were trying to see if we could allow people to, instead of knowing what they're looking for in advance and sort of having that, I know what I want kind of search, allowing a discoverability of being able to provide a way to maybe have an entry point into the data with one search term, and then be able to click through and dig down into the data, finding other tokens of interest to cluster the data. Um, so very cool. And I hope we get to see more of those kinds of visualization and discovery tools. I think Thank they're you. super I would important. I love to, to learn more about your project. Uh, sure, too. I'd be happy to share that. Thanks. Um, anybody else want to talk about that? I just wanted to add um, from the Taxon Works question that Elspeth was um, adding. If you want to learn more about Taxon Works, what we do, who we are, who's participating, we have meetings every Wednesday. Um, we do different kinds of activities together to facilitate development of both the community and the use of the software. So join us on Wednesdays and I can tell you more. Come find me. Or questions to any?
Hi, this is uh, Sharif Islam from Disco. Uh, this is probably mostly for Matt or Dimitri. I was wondering how similar are the taxon pages for Catalog of Life and the taxon works? Are, are, are there any overlaps or common things there, or, uh, especially for the nomenclature the description? Well, uh, uh, nomenclature-wise, uh, it could be quite similar. We don't have Catalog of Life schema. Uh, we we extended uh, uh, high level of uh, nomenclature studies. I didn't mention which we have nomen ontology. Basically, we try to represent all different kinds of uh, nomenclature statuses and uh, nomenclature relationships between uh, taxon names, and uh, we. When we convert data to catalog of life, we can basically use the called DP schema to simplify data representation. Uh, and taxon pages, as Matt pointed, uh, have modular structure. Uh, it's not just about nomenclature. We try to put additional information. Matt already presented distribution maps, um, uh, distribution biological associations, uh, bibliography, and potentially uh, different kinds of data which may may have in the project. Thank you. More questions to any of the presenters or do we have questions in the chat? Well, I have a question either for Matthew or for you, Dimitri. Uh, what is the sustainable model of uh, taxing works? Meaning, is it going to be here in 10 years time or is just project based and then it will disappear or how is that I, aspect I managed? Can maybe, I can maybe answer that. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Matt. Yeah. Um, so this is for group is endowed. We have contributions that um, fund around f nine full-time employees and our state of the endowment is good. Um, there's no foreseeable end to that data. So we're very fortunate uh, to have this opportunity to use tools that I think are much needed in our community in general. So for the foreseeable future, as far as we know, we are we are solid. It's coming from the original founder of the group, um, from, from basically a, uh, an investment group. So yeah, it's, and we should be here for a good long time. Thank you. Any more questions? Then if not, we break for a, a long coffee break. Oh, sorry, David. So I think going back to Johan's talk too, I made a comment in the chat that those of you in the room wouldn't necessarily get to see. Um, and about the reference to a barbecue that I made in the chat, this notion of getting together, Johan, regularly with colleagues and trying to figure out how an example would be um, any community, the particular taxonomic community example is depending on the same person for 20 years to manage your nomenclature literature. And th that person all of a sudden is going to retire. How are you going to facilitate the, are you going to find the next person who's going to do it for you and manage all your nomenclatural data for the next 20 years? And is that sustainable? Does that give you an opportunity to share expertise? Does it give you an opportunity to invite new people to the table? And so when I was part and am part of the carpentries world, I learned from the programming world, this concept of a barbecue. It's very simple. Um, it's essentially a standing meeting that happens let, at some periodic frequency, in this case, every two weeks. And two people might show up in your group, eight people might show up, maybe 15, but there's a goal. In this case, processing, pulling out literature information, which may get more and more automated as we go, but someone will still need to look at it, make sure that it's accurate. Um, but it's an opportunity then. You'll have someone who knows the software very well. Ooh, how do you do this in TaxonWorks, right? Or someone's there and you read a paper and you go, ooh, I need somebody that knows ICZN really well because I don't really understand if, if what they're saying here about what this name is now. So when you meet, 
when you, when you send an email, you might get an answer if you have a question. You might get an answer tomorrow, right? You might get an answer in three days. Even if you put a note on Slack, you might get a response right away. You might not. But the standing meeting allows you to know that when you get there, you're in a social space where you can do your work, but there's other people there to ping that have different expertise. And then you can invite new people to join you in this effort. And one concrete example we have that I'm giving you recently was a group that could project, they could see the number of new papers being published going like this, going up asymptotically, right? Just increasing. And the line of the, uh, their ability as a community to manage that data was either level or barely, barely going up. So the lines were not going to come together. And in, its, in six months of essentially meeting every other week, they now see joy, right? Now now this curve is here and the, and the level of productivity, they can actually predict when those lines are gonna cross. And this does a couple of things. It brings hope and engagement to the community. It changes the way they feel about themselves as a group. And it also then gives them a different focus. Oh, we're now caught up. We can work on this new thing, right? We can work on biological association data. We can work on linking. We can work on a new feature that we need. Um, but just a simple idea really, uh, to give you that isn't it isn't rocket science, but it's this question about how do we do our business and how can we foster innovative inclusion in the, the ways that we do things and in the software uh, that we have to do it. So thank you for letting me explain barbecues. So again, any other intervention? Then, well, with this, we break for coffee and we resume session at 11 o'clock. Thank you. And thank you to all the presenters and the supporting tech team.